Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. But when it comes to Veterans Day and days like this, the thing that always seems to touch me is uh, the subjects of honor and respect. Honor and integrity. Honor and character. Uh, the world is full of a lot of characters. But it doesn't seem to be, it doesn't seem to be full of a lot of character. You know, for centuries, authors have written stories about the younger generation, and I think it's always funny. One time I even read a, read a story that was written during the time of the Roman Empire. And one thing that they said was this younger generation just has no respect. That's what they always said, they, all the way back to the Roman Empire. Well, this younger generation has no respect. During the turn of the century in the 1900s, there was a, an article written out of a newspaper in New York talking about this younger generation. And I remember hearing my mom say one time, well, those kids in the city wearing those zoot suits. Well, I don't know if you remember what zoot suits are. Probably nobody here remembers. Oh, you remember what zoot suits are. Well, it, to the best of my recollection, every generation has its own designer clothes. In my younger generation, designer clothes was a Jimi Hendrix afro, sandals, bell bottoms, tank top, tie-dyed, beads, and you were cool. You know. Well, at least we thought we were. You know, but then before hippies was beatniks. Maynard G. Krebs, you know, beatniks. And before beatniks was zoot suiters. These are the guys, the way I understand it, the, the pants were real tight at the legs, and they and they were like suits, and the and the coats were down to here, and they had a gold chain, and they would swing that chain. You know, you've probably seen them back in the movies and didn't realize they were zoot suiters. I like them. I want one. Every time I see one, I want one. And I go down to the store and I ask for a zoot suit, and they look at me like, we don't have them here at the big and tall store. So, at any rate, every generation seems to think that it's the previous generation, or the, the coming up generation, the kids. They think it's the kids that's the problem. But one thing we never seem to realize it's the adults that train the kids. You know, the kids, basically, they inherit what we give them. And so, maybe it's just uh, the lack of respect that we show that they're picking up on. I remember one time, a few years ago, there was a young guy here at the church. And his parents were off down at a store and... Uh, it's not like the time where your parents left and forgot and left you at the store. I, it seems like you told me that story about something happened up in New York. But bottom line is, these the parents left, and, and um, the kid needed a ride. And so I was going that way anyway, so I said, sure, I'll take you. So we're in my car, and we're on our way down uh, Business 54, headed to the place where I'm going to drop him off. And he pulls out a candy bar. And he unwraps the candy bar, and he starts to eat it. And I, I notice he's looking around. He looks around. He takes the candy bar wrapper and throws it out the window. And I said to this young guy who was in our children's church, I said, hey, you know, you shouldn't litter. That's, that's not good. You shouldn't litter. He says, well, Dad says if you look around and you don't see a policeman, it's okay. <laughs> and I had a talk with his dad. But see, here's the whole thing. If we're training up our kids that it's okay to not do what's right as long as you don't get caught, see, that, that's not good. Character, see, character, I've heard it explained this way. Character is something that, that people see in you. But integrity is the way you live when they don't see you. How do you live when nobody's going to know how you're living. It's a secret just between you and God. Hmm, interesting. Well, 
The Bible says in Proverbs 20, 29 that gray hair is to be respected. And I didn't used to think that, but I kind of think that now. Um, some of you kind of felt like I turned gray awfully quick a couple of years ago. No, I just quit using, using Grecian Formula 409 or whatever it was. You know, because as much as I'd try to make my hair look the color that it originally used to be, it always kind of came out some kind of a weird red. And I never was red. In fact, I was blonde. I was a natural blonde. A, a tall, skinny, if you can imagine that, Swede. My, I'm Swedish. Just, okay, look, just picture Fabio. <laughs> That's kind of the way I used to be. See, and the problem is people marry people when they look like Fabio. And then time goes by. Oh, I was waiting for that. Thank you. Yeah. Hmm. My, uh, my background's a Baptist background. I grew up at, uh, in Spring Valley Baptist Church in Raytown, Missouri. Reverend, Reverend Joe C. Porter was my pastor. I grew up in the church from a little kid, and, and he was uh, Pastor Porter. Pastor Porter. And... Um, It's difficult sometimes to say things like this because I'm a pastor. And people think, well, you're trying to get respect for you. And I, and I, and I thank you, you know, that, uh, that most of you, you know, you know, you honor the position of pastor in the church, you know. I see Pastor Larry and stuff like that. Um, but in a lot of places... Reverence for position is, is not honored. Um, once again, my pastor was named Joe C. Porter. But when I was in my 20s and Jimi Hendrix was singing the song, Hey Joe, I would have never gone up to my pastor and said, Hey Joe. No, I mean, he was Brother Porter. He was Brother Porter or he was Pastor Porter. Um, there just seems to be a certain amount of honor and respect that has been lost across the board. And I'm not, I'm not getting on to us. I'm just saying this is something we need to think about. Uh, a good, good friend, somebody I've known all my life, and uh, was John Ashcroft. He was, uh, he's an older person, so probably a lot of you younger people don't know exactly who he is. But at 9-11, he was the Attorney General of the United States of America. In fact, he was the one that President Bush said... Uh, go get bin Laden. It was his job to get bin Laden. And I knew uh, John Ashcroft back before he was attorney general. I knew him when he was governor. He used to call me up and my nickname was Jimmy Swaggart. Hey, is Jimmy there? You know, all great honor and respect for me he had. And so, uh, <laughs> but, but then I knew him before he was governor. I knew him back when he was attorney general of the state of Missouri, and I knew him before that when he was running for attorney general. In fact, I remember when he came to my office one day, and we went out to get, put something in his car, <laughs> and here's a guy that became attorney general of the United States. We went out to put something in his car, and he had to take the clothes hanger loose from the hole in his trunk that he had it wrapped around his bumper with. Uh, you know, so he didn't necessarily, I'd say, come from whatever a lot of money. But but I will say this, uh, Loretta and I were going to be in Washington, D.C. one time, and he heard we were going to be there, and so he called us and asked us if we would go over to, this is when he was Attorney General, if he we'd come over to the Justice Department for a, a Bible study for him and his staff. There's about eight of us there, I guess, and uh, which, by the way, he was a great man of God. It, the memory verse for the people that day was... Uh, a chapter out of Psalms, a chapter. Their memory verse was a chapter. And he asked him, he said, how many of you memorized your memory verse? And like, he all sat there, his staff, you know. So he said, well, I thought so. So he, he said, I've got it all printed out for you. So he passed a printout around of, of uh, the chapter. Well, what chapter was it? It was either 24th or 42nd. 
24th or so. And uh, so at any rate, we all read it together. And then after everybody left, we, we spent some time together with him in his office. But here's the deal. Uh, when we were there, we knew him personally from years before, but you still respect, you don't say, hey, John. I mean, the guy's the Attorney General of the United States. In fact, just before our meeting, he had met with the President, just, just before our meeting. And uh, so, you know, you... If you're going to go see the president, it doesn't matter if it's a president you like or a president you don't like. You don't show up at the Oval Office in your uh, Tommy Bahama T-shirt and, and Bermuda shorts and flip-flops with your sunglasses on the back of your head saying, hey, Prez. No, you don't. <laughs> you don't. First of all, you probably wouldn't get in. Now you say, well, why are we talking about honor and respect among the president? Well, here's the deal. In Washington, D.C., you'll have senators that are on one side of the aisle and senators that are on the other side of the aisle, and they may not like the way each other think. They may not like each other at all. But they still refer to them as the senator from whatever state or the gentleman from whatever state. They still have respect for the position and so there is a, a, a place of honor that's built in. Now what I'm building up to is this. We need to have respect and honor for God. And our casual, there's nothing wrong with being casual. Don't anybody think I'm talking about how you're dressed today or any day for that matter. That's not what I'm talking about. But what I am talking about is this. Just a general underlying respect for God and the house of God. Not because we have to hire a maintenance crew to fix something. That's Once again, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about uh, general respect. I remember one day uh, I was up at the front door and a young man came. He was a visitor. And he had a, uh, a T-shirt on. And on the front of the T-shirt was the front of a naked lady. Well, if he turned around, on the back was the back of a naked lady. And he came in with a couple of other young teenagers from our church. And to be quite honest, we couldn't let him in the auditorium like that. I mean, you know, we, we have to draw a line here. But there's a way of dealing with him to where he doesn't feel like we hate him. Are, are you following me? There's a way of dealing with him. And, uh, you know, so I just go over and I put my arm around him and say, uh, there's something about your T-shirt. And he goes, I know. I said, do you want to come to church today? Well, yeah. I said, well, you, do you have another T-shirt in the car? No, this is all I got that was clean. I said, well, here's an idea. I would rather much see that little Hanes tag hanging out the back than see what's hanging out the front and <laughs> whatever <laughs> and he got to laughing so he went in the bathroom turned his t-shirt inside out and you couldn't tell it it was you know and he came to church well some people I've related that story before and I actually had a person say well you should have just let him on in we're adults we you know we've seen things like that before we're not well you just reach a point where you have to have honor and respect for the house of God. Th there's, there's a line that can be drawn. And in the Bible, in the Bible, there are places where people cross that line and it wasn't real healthy for them. So I think, and this is one thing I love about this church and about this congregation, is there seems to be a lot of respect for God. Now, there's all kinds of honor and respect things going on in our nation right now. And um, it's, it's difficult when you look at the issues. But I think that whether you like some things or don't like some things, there needs to be a general consensus 
of this is who we are. And we, we are in a nation. Loretta and I travel to a lot of nations. Uh, sometimes our trips get scheduled way out there. In fact, we have a trip now going to Australia and New Zealand scheduled for 2019. I mean, this, this is how far out some things get scheduled. And we've been in a lot of other countries. And let me tell you something. We have freedoms here that we take for granted. I say, there are freedoms here we really take for granted. And even in other free countries, you can really get in a lot of trouble for doing things that over here people just do. You know, in Singapore, if you chew gum and throw it on the ground, you can be arrested. You say, oh, that's silly. Well, it may be silly to us, but it's not silly to the people in Singapore, and there are people in jail because of it. Look, here's what the Bible says. Let's take a look at some scriptures. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7. A righteous man, the righteous man, walks in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. So what does this mean? The righteous man, he doesn't dabble in his integrity. He doesn't have integrity sometimes. What? He walks in it. You know, in the same way that the Bible tells us to walk by faith, we're to be led by the Spirit, that, that, that implies that's something you need to do all the time. The righteous man walks in his integrity. You know the phrase, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas? It's a lie. <laughs> it's not true. Trust me, I know people who've been there, and when they came back, it came back with them. The previous generation knew how to walk in integrity. I like to collect old things. And uh, when I was a kid, you, you didn't know this, but when I was a kid, I used to collect postcards. Yeah, when I, But uh, the Gonsets gave me this postcard today because they knew I liked to collect old things. And uh, I collected all you guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's a postcard from 1940. Interesting, isn't it? A postcard from 1940. What it reminds me of when I see these old postcards like this is how the young people of that generation gave so much honor and respect to the freedom that they had. Now, Loretta's dad, at the age of 17, lied about his age. He lied about his age so he could go and fight in the, in the war, in World War II. Now, why would somebody do that? You know, now in my generation, people would lie about their age so that they wouldn't have to go to war. I'm serious. And, uh, but, but there's something about what's inside of you. You know, the, uh, and, and a difference, and I'm, I'm not going to talk about the issues. I don't, I'm not talking about the issues. I'm talking about the general respect. Um, that generation, when it came time to protect our nation, I was reading a story uh, actually just yesterday about how the baseball players, they laid down their bats. They gave up their contracts, and they enlisted, and they went to fight on the beaches in Normandy and various places. I mean, they put their lives on the line when they were sports people. And Major League Baseball, MLB, I mean, they, they realized that USA deserved more than MLB. And I think sometimes we get out of balance on what's really important. You know, your life that you live for Jesus, the life you live for Jesus, is more important than any other life you can live. And the integrity that you have, this verse implies strongly that that integrity will be passed down to the next generation. And I think it's time that our generation quits blaming the kids. You say, boy, these kids don't have any respect. Well, once again, who trained these kids? Who raised these kids? 
things were different. My parents' generation had enough stamina to pass laws that were Christian, and some of them weren't all that necessary. But, you know, look, hey, when I was in junior high, when I first got my driver's license, and I was driving my 1960 Pontiac, the Cadillac taillight. When I, well, that was after my 46 Ford, 46 Plymouth, that's what. But when I got my driver's license, did you know that it was illegal in the state of Missouri to have a store open on Sunday? When I, when I was in junior high, when I went into high school, and I'm 70, just so you'll all know, when I went into high school, when I got my driver's license, even though it was legal for gas stations to be open on Sunday, most gas stations didn't open on Sunday because they respected Sunday as the day that everybody went to church. And the schools did not have sports on Sunday. Baseball games were later in the afternoon. But my, how we've changed. You know, we've got people out of church today because of sports. We've got people out of church today because of deer hunting. We've got people out of church today just because they slept in. I'm not critical. I'm not, I don't, don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is, is the going to the house of God and respecting and honoring the things of God have somewhat been pushed aside, and it's not the children's fault. We have nobody to blame but ourselves. You know, who, who made it legal to buy liquor on Sunday in Missouri? Who made it legal? My generation. So how do we do this? Well, you know, some of these things, we, we don't live in an earthly kingdom. We live in the kingdom of God. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. Our treasures are stored up somewhere beyond the blue. The, the reality is, is I'm a part of the kingdom of God. The United States is where I live on earth, and people watching, you may have another country where you live on earth, but my kingdom is the kingdom of God. And I have to decide which kingdom I'm going to live in. Now, just because my earthly kingdom says something is legal doesn't mean that it's legal in my heavenly kingdom. Just, okay, now, Look, I'm, I'm meddling here, but that's okay. I got the microphone, and there's the door. And I love you. I didn't mean, didn't mean that bad. I didn't mean that bad. <laughs> but just because the government says it's legal to do certain things doesn't mean that it's not a sin in the eyes of God. And just because the government says this is okay doesn't mean it's okay for you if you're in the kingdom of God. Because we actually have a higher standard and we have a rule book that takes us a step holier than any earthly rule book. We've got to decide which constitution we live by. We give respect to the earthly constitution because the Bible says we need to pray for our leaders. Right now, our, our president is Trump. Before Trump, it was Obama. Before Obama, it was Bush. It doesn't matter if you're a Bush lover or hater, an Obama lover or hater, or a Trump lover or, lover or hater. Irrelevant, you as the church are required to pray for the leader of our nation. And if we don't, we're not honoring our Constitution. You see? So, the Bible also says that we're accountable for our words. And have you ever stopped to think that if you have a president, once again, We'll just go back three. We'll just say whether it's Bush, Obama, or Trump. 
and you have a president and you constantly say, this guy's an idiot. He is stupid. He'll never amount to anything. He's going to get us into trouble. He's going to get our nation into debt. He's going to get us into war. Do you ever stop to think that you are a speaking spirit and according to the Bible you get what you say? Quit cursing the leaders, whoever they are, whether they are your party or not. Quit cursing them and bless them. You say, why should I do that? Because the Bible says, our Constitution says, that's the way we live. We actually, we actually love our enemies. You may not agree with your enemy. You may not, that doesn't mean you've got to vote with your enemy. But you've got to love your enemy. And you give honor and respect to the position, whether you agree with them or not. There are senators that I have met that I really don't like them. I'm not going to mention any names, but we've sat in the office of some senators in Washington, D.C. that it just almost makes your stomach turn. And I wouldn't vote for them And I wouldn't agree with their policies because I don't believe in killing babies. Okay? I don't, I don't believe that. And I believe that marriage should be between a man and a woman. So if, if a senator doesn't agree with that and votes to the contrary constantly, I detest that vote. But I still give honor and respect to the position. And when Loretta and I walk into their office, we still walk into the senator's office wearing our best, treating them with respect, not being rude to their receptionist. We, well, we want to speak with Senator whoever. No, we go, you go in with respect. Why is that? Because you respect the position because the Bible tells us to. And when it says honor those who are in authority, that doesn't mean you honor the evil things they do, but you honor the position. A Christian must have integrity. Let's take a look at another verse. Titus 2.6. Likewise, exhort the young men. Who is supposed to exhort the young men? Titus 2.6. Who is to exhort the young men? I mean, the implication is it's not the other young men. It's the older guys like Jerry. <laughs> and me. And Terry, and just go around the room, all of us who are above 40. But exhort the younger men to be sober minded. Now, that's not talking about telling them, don't take a drink. No, that's sober minded. That means that think straight, don't get caught off into some weird way of thinking. Be sober-minded. Now, verse 7. In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. Well, this tells us how we train these young men. Now, I respect Terry. I respect his son. But you can see that his son has been trained by a man of God. And I've known Terry for many years, and I can tell you this. He lives his life doing a pattern of good works. Well, what does the Bible call good works? Um, you know, remember Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works. Well, if you, if you research that out, good works in the Bible means that you're obedient to the word of God. So show yourself to be a pattern of good works. Now, what does that mean? Why does it have the word pattern in there? That's, it doesn't mean you just every now and then do a good work. And it's kind of like spotty in life. Well, I, you, you should see what I did three weeks ago Saturday. And I was down here and, and you know, it's the way you live your life every day, a pattern. A pattern. That means consistently. A pattern of good works in doctrine. Now, the word doctrine, how many took my Greek class? 
Uh, I've got a couple of students in here. Doctrine means, what's that word mean? <laughs> okay, it's, the Greek word is didaskalos. Didaskalos. And it means teaching. So show yourself to be a pattern of good works in teaching. So you are to teach, the older men are to teach the younger men what? Integrity. You teach them, you teach them showing integrity. Now I, I thought that was neat when I saw that because it doesn't say teach them about integrity. You see the difference? You're not teaching them about integrity. You're teaching them showing integrity. In other words, what they see in you. Look, uh, for those of you who have had training and counseling, one thing that you'll discover is a guy who beats his wife, which I did run into a situation one time where a couple came in and said, you know, we've got a, a problem, you know, we're, there's been a lot of beating going on in our, our family. And I, I looked at the man and I said, uh, I said, have you, how long have you been doing this all your life? And he said, it's not me, it's her. <laughs> she was little. Let me tell you something. I learned that day that little women can beat the tar out of you. He had bru he had, that guy, he was a big guy. He had bruises all over him. Okay, but a pattern of good works in teaching, showing integrity. One thing we've discovered over the years with counseling is this. Guys who beat their wives probably grew up in a house where their dad beat their mama. And before that, grandpa beat grandma. Because what you do in your house, your kids will pick it up. And, and that spirit, you know, one thing that may be a little different about this church than some churches, we actually believe that demonic spirits exist. And even though a Christian, by nature of having the Spirit of God inside your spirit, even though you cannot be possessed, you can still be tormented, oppressed, afflicted by, and you can have spirits hanging off of you from generations. So you have a pattern of good works in teaching, showing integrity, and the way that is there with that little comma, it's and showing reverence. Uh, one thing that I, I, I've noticed in here, when somebody is up here praying, everybody in the room quits talking. I've noticed that. That's good. Ushers can be talking to somebody. Somebody on the platform starts to pray. What happens? They go. We honor and respect somebody talking to God. Reverence. Uh, this building right here used to be a basketball court. And it just has wood and steel and concrete holding it together. There's nothing holy about the materials that put this thing together. But this is an area that's dedicated to the service of God. It's an area that's been consecrated and we, we call it our sanctuary. We call it our auditorium. We have different names for it. But the reality is, uh, and I catch myself in this too, we need to be different in this part of the building than we are in the fellowship hall. Hey, over in the fellowship hall, you can be slapping somebody on the back, telling a joke, laughing, and all that kind of stuff. Why? It's the fellowship hall. But when we've got ministers up here ministering at the end of the service and praying for people, and I've noticed this, and I like this. Everybody kind of keeps it down. They realize ministry is going on. And they slip out to an area where they can talk. But once again, the materials in this building are no different than the materials on the other side of the building. But there are areas in our life where we need to have reverence, where we need to have respect. And what happens is, is if we do that, God can speak to us easier if we reverence him. Look at this. 
a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing integrity, showing reverence, showing incorruptibility. What is, what is that? that? That is when you're filling out your tax forms and there's a little box you can check and no one's going to know that you're checking it but you. But if you check it, you're going to get back an extra thousand bucks or something and all you got to do is check the box and nobody's ever going to check it. I mean, nobody's ever going to over, oversee what you did. But you know, you know that what it says that you're checking there is not really true. And an average person will say, it doesn't matter. Nobody's ever going to check this. Just check that box. You get back an extra thousand. Well, if, if what you're checking is a lie, that's corruption. You say, well, no one's going to catch me. It's not about whether anybody catches you or not. It's about whether is it corruption or not. That gets back to the same thing as the kid throwing the paper out on the highway, his candy bar wrapper. Well, no one's going to catch me, so Dad says it's okay as long as there's no policeman around here to give me a ticket for littering. Do you want to live your life doing things based upon whether you can get away with it or not? Do you want to be married to someone who has the mental attitude? Well, if I can get away with it, it's okay. No, we need to be incorruptible. How do I know that? The Bible tells me so. We, we are supposed to be incorruptible. Right? Right, April? Okay. Now let's take a look at uh, the rest of that verse. Verse 8. Still talking about having a pattern of what? Sound speech that cannot be condemned. That one who is an opponent may be ashamed. Why? Having nothing evil to say of you. Wouldn't it be nice if you stood up and took a stand on something and somebody who didn't agree with you, they were an opponent, they couldn't say anything because they just can't find anything wrong with you. They would love to tear you down, but there's nothing that they can use because you've lived your life with a pattern of sound words, a pattern of incorruptibility, a pattern of integrity. Wow. See, the nature of a Christian should be different than the nature of the people in the world. And I know that, that part of what we're celebrating today, uh, Veterans Day, but it shouldn't be just the veterans. We should, we should have honor and respect for mankind. We need to quit talking about people. We need to quit doing things that we can get away with just because we can get away with it. You know, if you're going to get that extra $1,000 because you told a lie and you checked that box, are you going to tithe on that $1,000 that you stole? <laughs> you know, well, you know, I've, I've heard people, I, I actually had a man say that, you know, he was going to get an extra $10,000 in a business deal. He said, he's, and he knew it was crooked what he was doing. <laughs> Jerry, you'll get a bang out of this. He said, he said, well, I'm, I'm sure God approves because God knows I'm a tither. Well, that, that makes a lot of sense. Let's just go down and rob the bank. We can get a half a million dollars, but if we tithe on it, I guess it's okay, right, Doc? It's okay as long as we tithe on it. No, it's not. <laughs> we can't be corruptible and expect God to bless our corruption. Wow. Okay. Well, how do we know that that scripture really applies to us? Well, we're going to turn over to Loretta's favorite scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16. It says, All scripture... Wow, does that include the verse we just read? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Wow. Look at the next verse, though. Verse 17. That, 
Now, the way we would say it here in the Ozarks is, so that, so that the man of God, and that means woman of God too, that's, so that the person of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every, look what it took us back to, for every good work. Wow. Praise God. Okay, well, um, I thought I was completely done until Penny Maroney, in the, on, sitting on the back row, held up her offering envelope and waved it around. Ah, several of you have. So we will receive our offering, all right? And um, if you have recently robbed a bank, do not tithe on it. We, we don't, well, no, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, we'll, we'll pray over it, we'll put it to good use. Ah, what did you learn anything today? You know, the Word of God is just so full of truths. And sometimes we think we're just sailing along and we're doing so great. And, and by and large, you know, the, the people of this church and our congregation, we, we have a good life and a lot of good things are happening. But we, we cannot ignore honor and respect for each other. We can't. And we cannot ignore honor and respect for God and the things of God. And I, I know my generation, while you're getting your offerings ready, I'll just tell you this. My generation was probably one of the worst. I remember Loretta and I being at a Bible study, and we had this one guy who was a real hippie who always came to our Bible studies. And he would pray like, yo, man, big man up there, yo, big guy in the sky. I want to talk to you. <laughs> That's the way he would pray. And at the time, you know, I was at the age where I thought, cool. But now looking back on it, boy, that wasn't, you know, I'm glad I wasn't sitting next to that guy. <laughs> you know, God wouldn't do that. If, if you don't, quote, talk right to God, um, he's a God of grace and mercy. If that's where you are, I think it's a lot safer and better to have some respect and honor. You know, and you know, we, we talk about how God doesn't change. In the Old Testament, before Jesus came, God told his priests how to dress. And he told them some things to straighten up about themselves before they went into the Holy of Holies. Because if they didn't, you know, they had a bell attached to them. When the priest went into the Holy of Holies, they had a bell and a rope attached to their leg. And they went into the Holy of Holies after consecrating themselves for a year, and they went in there to say the name of God 26 times and to sprinkle 26 times the blood on the altar. But if they weren't consecrated just quite right, they might just die in there. Well, nobody else could go in to get them. So when they heard the bell quit ringing, they gave the rope a couple quick tugs. They didn't feel any movement. Well, drag that guy out from behind the... You know, once a year they went in there. Can you imagine how it was from God's perspective? The guy falls down and he sees the rope pull the guy out. God's thinking, well, maybe next year. <laughs> Ah, uh, that was humor, but that 